have money tend to have more access to resources to be able to use in their defense versus people that don't have money. So you see a lot of, you know, lower in, and that's really a class issue and, and race does come into play. This is Let Your Voice Be Heard right here on WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. Good morning and welcome to Let Your Voice Be Heard right here on WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. My name is Selena Hill. Very happy to be here, guys. I hope you're having a happy Black Panther Sunday. I know I am. I'm still basically reeling off of Wakanda and all of that uh, magnificence of that movie. Um, if you are watching via Ustream, shout out to you. You probably noticed that I'm sitting in Stanley's seat. And we Why? are. Because <laughs> he's not here. So, yeah, again, my name is Selena Hill. This is Let Your Voice Be Heard, where we talk politics, social issues, foreign policy, and pop culture from a diverse millennial perspective. And you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Miss Selena Hill. And Miss is spelled with an M-S. Alyssa? Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Alyssa Fuchs, and uh, I'm your political and legal correspondent, although I don't know if there's very much legal um, coming in today with the Black Panther conversation, um, but uh, there's definitely some political, for sure. Um, and you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Alyssa Fuchs, that's Alyssa with an I, or on Twitter at Alyssa Fuchs, also Alyssa with an I, um, or you can leave a comment on the Politically Preposterous fan page, or on the Let Your Voice Be Heard radio live stream once I get that back up and running. Absolutely. So if you notice, again, Stanley's not here, Jackie's not here, but we have our trusty friend and correspondent here, <laughs> Tiffany Brown is here. Welcome back, Tiffany. Hi, thanks for having me. I love being with you guys on a early Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how much of that was sarcasm. but um, It was just a bit, but no, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about Black Panther and all my thoughts and feels. It's going to be a great show. Side note, Tiffany came in here wearing her um, formation jacket. <laughs> yes. Like, she is in full formation. <laughs> yes. Okay? Yes. Like, Tiffany, did you wear a dashiki when you went to see Black Panther? No, Panda? but I did have my jacket on. I did have my jacket on. That was my little nod to, um, you know, Black Panther. Okay. Uh, I, I heard people went in costume yeah, and absolutely. all dressed up and stuff. Like, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. It was... Well, all out. All you know, don't worry. Out. Don't don't worry. Wait till Halloween when the white people start dressing up at, as Black Panther. No oh, black no. face. Anybody want to take bets on, on, on that happening? Because I'm oh going to guarantee you it's going to happen. Oh, I Which, know. They're going to ruin it. There's a right way to do it. And Tiffany just said, <laughs> don't use blackface. Right. Yeah. You can put the costume on, of course. But please don't try to be an African. That, that's just, you never, you don't live it, in it never It never plays out the way you want it to play out. So <laughs> just don't do it. It really never. doesn't. It really doesn't, guys. And okay, so we're going to be talking about Black Panther. We're going to start the show off talking about some of the crazy news stories and happenings that have been happening uh, all throughout the week from the Florida school shooting to Trump's latest tweet. And of course, we want you to chime in. You can call us up at 212 650 6903. You can also tweet at us at beheard underscore radio. And if we, if you guys are lucky enough to see us on uh, Facebook Live. We're working on that. We're working on it. You can check out, um, you can leave comments there as well. So on that note, we do have to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. When we come back, we're talking Black Panther, the Florida school shooting, Russiagate, and everything else. This is Let Your Voice Be Heard. And we are back. This is Let Your Voice Be Heard right here on WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. Hey again, guys. This is Selena Hill. I'm here with my co-host, Alyssa Fuchs, and our correspondent, Tiffany Brown, is here. Yes. And uh, we have a lot to talk about. So we're going to actually start off the show talking about that horrific school shooting that happened in Florida this week. I mean... This 19-year-old white nationalist walks into the school that he was expelled from, pulls a fire alarm, and opens fire, killing 17 teenagers. Then he's uh, arrested, taken to jail, and of course, we hear the narratives about this white man having mental illness. I'm not saying he doesn't. There are reports that he was diagnosed with autism. He suffered from depression. He had a quote-unquote hard knock life. <laughs> Bear with me. And, oh, you know, we have our president. He responds, oh, yes, we need to talk about mental illness and we need to uh, deal with this epidemic. My thoughts, guys, when I heard that, 
And I found out that Nicholas Cruz was actually uh, has been confirmed as a white nationalist. That he there's pictures of him holding guns while wearing the Make America Great Again hat. I'm like, Mr. President, this is a loyal Trump supporter. This is the result of the rise of white nationalism and supremacy that has turned violent. What were you? What did you guys think about this? Right. I mean, listen. I think that's definitely a part of it. I won't say that that's not a part of it. But this also has to do with guns. Um, you know, this is, a, you know, I basically want like four hundred or something mass shootings, uh, um, base, since uh, even uh, you know or school shootings since Sandy Hook, where literally children were killed and nothing was done. And I believe I heard a statistic, and I'm not 100% sure on this. This is about something like the 1,500th school or mass shooting, and it's an end or, since Columbine, which was the first what they'll call modern mass shooting or school shooting, uh, which was in 1996 in Littleton, Colorado. Um, and, and people want to talk about this issue as if guns are not the problem. And, you know... I am somebody who shoots guns and lights guns and is in favor of the Second Amendment. But I also recognize that the Second Amendment does not give somebody an unlimited right to own any type of weapon they want, number one. Um, and that there are reasonable limits that can be set on the Second Amendment that don't necessarily infringe on somebody's right to bear arms. And so it is well past time for us to have a conversation about guns. Uh, until 1994, the AR-15 assault rifle was banned. Um, and then in 1994, that ban expired. And the first mass shooting that we see happens in 1996. And since then, we've had between 15 and 1600 of them. And that tells you something. Um, it is much, much more difficult to commit a mass shooting with a handgun that has a clip with 10 bullets in it versus using a type of rifle that can fire 30 bullets a minute and can have a capacity of up to 100 bullets of ammunition, um, depending on which state you live in. So... You know, listen, I'm, I'm hopeful that the students are now going to join this conversation as they already have. And I know we're going to try and get a clip of Emma Gonzalez up for you. Um, but we have to talk about guns. Tiffany? In addition to we have to talk about guns, you mentioned, Alyssa, Sandy Hook. And those were, like you said, children, babies. And that's when I knew that our elected officials on both sides, out they weren't going to do anything real. You know, these were five-year-olds that didn't, you know, couldn't even form full sentences okay their highlight of their day was probably recess and nap time and we allowed them to get killed in places where we were supposed to feel safe now when I went to high school I never imagined that I would have to fear being shot up at school that's just my reality I graduated from high school in 2006 you know the biggest thing was like you know fights at the train station and stuff like that but you never really imagined someone walking into your school with the AR-15 like that's wild to me and additionally like this country you know we talk about the second amendment we talk about the right to bear arms but that is not even applied across the board equally we know who has the right to bear arms we know who can go and walk into gun stores and walk into these you know these shows and buy multiple guns and they form little militias because they're preparing for something or whatever but you know black and brown people we, we don't have that luxury of holding AR15s okay we get caught with a gun in New York state you're going to go up north for multiple years and that's real so i think we need to have a real conversation about how we 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 digest violence and how we talk about violence in this country because we are a violent country okay what's happening here we do it in other countries as well like this is not just a homegrown issue we're bringing terror and violence to other countries as well so this i don't think there will ever be any real gun reform we're built on well, violence let, uh, talking so. about um tiffany you're right we need to talk about violence but our president isn't in mm -hmm. fact he tweeted on saturday uh taking shots at the fbi so if you ha guys haven't been following the full story the fbi has admitted uh, missteps um they were flagged about nicholas Cruz, and instead of taking action, he kind of just slipped through the cracks. And the FBI director has taken full responsibility. So President Trump jumps on Twitter and attacks the FBI and says that basically saying, and I'm paraphrasing, if they weren't focusing so much on Russia Gate, they would have got, um, they would have taken some action against Nicholas Cruz. 
but there's no direct correlation between the two. No, I mean, this is a huge red herring because they're two separate divisions Absolutely. of the FBI. There's the criminal division of the FBI and the field offices, and then there's the intelligence division of the FBI, which is the kind of thing that looks into Russian interference and the Russian hacking into the election. They're two completely separate divisions of the FBI, which, you know, you should think that the, the president of all people should know that these are two separate definition divisions of the FBI. Um, but I also wanted to make a comment about something you said, Tiffany, because I saw this meme um, and it was like, uh, basically, I, I, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know exactly what it said, but it said something like black men. Everybody go out and buy an AR-15 tomorrow and they'll be banned by midday noon of next week. <laughs> yep. I mean, we saw what happened when the Black Panther Party um, of the 1960s and 70s started arming themselves with guns in California. That's when California put uh, it took a lot of measure to restrict gun access right in that state because black people started arming themselves with guns. Right. I mean, listen, the only other thing about this is just the straight up hypocrisy of Republicans (laughs) all the time um, in in two levels. Number one, um, whenever somebody commits a, 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 a crime like this, like, for example, San Bernardino and they're Muslim, there's oh, yes. never a conversation about mental health. Um, nope. It's automatically like terrorism. Yep. Um, but, you know, whenever it's a white person that does this kind of thing, it's like, well, maybe he was mentally ill or we have to have a conversation about mental health. And, you know, what? we should have conversations about mental health and about how we don't have enough health care funding for people who have mental health issues. Um, and we can also talk about how Donald Trump actually lifted the ban on yep. people who have mental health issues being able to purchase a firearm um, when that was one of the first things he did in office. So, like, there's so many levels of hypocrisy to this. Um, But at the end of the day, Republicans can continue to offer their thoughts and their prayers. But thoughts and prayers are not going to solve this problem. We need action, policy, reform. We need change and policy. You're absolutely right, Alyssa. Um, I'm going to actually take that. Shift gears a little bit because, like I mentioned, Donald Trump has been trying to uh, redirect our attention to the FBI. But the FBI has actually been doing a really good job at investigating um, Russiagate. So Robert Mueller released, uh, I think it was Friday, 13 indictments of Russians who have been and were involved in the 2016 election to help Donald Trump win. It's undeniable at this point. They released a, like a 37-page expose just detailing and laying out everything that's been, that happened in 2016. And it also shows that Russians and the bots, they're definitely going to try to interfere in our 2018 election. And they're going to continue to just try to interfere in our democracy moving forward. Um, Tiffany, did you have any reaction to what's been going on the latest allegations and the latest unfoldings when it comes to Russiagate. When it comes to Russiagate, you know, he tweeted like this uh, recent indictment or slew of indictments just shows that there is just absolutely no collusion. And to me, it's just like, can you read, Mr. President? <laughs> like, do no, you know what words no. mean? Do you know what concepts and like theory? Like, do you understand? And like the people around you, like, are they just feeding you these things? And I just feel like, it's so frustrating when you had, not to bring it back to President Obama, but it's so frustrating when you have such a brilliant man who had to take hit after hit. And then we have this man that is so steeped in racism and bigotry and he could just get his base fired up on misinformation and taking things out of context. So when you see him tweet like that, it's like, what what documents are you reading? And I th- I'm going to use... Al Sharpton, I know people may feel very polarized by Al Sharpton, but he was like, you know, we can have different opinions, but we just can't have different facts. Right. right. And it's just like, that's what we just, literally is different facts. And I know everyone gets so steeped in their political ideologies, but at what point for his base will what he's doing be enough? Did he promise you what he said he was going to do? At what big, At what point will it be enough for them who put him in office to be like, listen, like, this is out of control. I mean, listen, you know, with with respect to the facts, I mean, that's the major issue, which is we used to have a situation where you could say the sky is blue and everybody would say, yeah, the sky is blue. um, But I think that we should do X. And the other side would say, but I think we should do Y. And they would have a conversation about doing X or doing Y or trying to find some kind of common ground in the middle of X or Y. Um, But they would all agree that the sky was blue. Uh, Now, I mean, you don't just see this in terms of Russiagate. You see this in terms of climate change, in terms of 
environmental policy, in terms of tax policy, um, in terms of health care policy. Uh, this is not the only place where, you know, Republicans are saying that the sky is red and, and Democrats are like, um, no, the sky is blue. Uh, but to get back to the Russia thing for a second, um, you know, it's sort of like, well, actually, number one. Donald Trump, I think, does read, but I think he just tells his base what they want to hear, regardless. Of, so I think he probably he knows what the truth is, but then he says something else because, oh, no. uh, you know, I, 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 I honestly don't believe that he, like, really doesn't actually know certain things. No, I think he's um, semi-illiterate. I, I don't know about that. I, I really um, and I think that we undervalue ourselves in thinking that because I, I think it's more... Um, so you think he's, like, this mastermind genius that has, like, a master plan? No, I... I, I, I I don't want to call him a mastermind genius, but I think he's evil. Um, and I think that part of it is that he understands this stuff and he is smart and he's manipulating people. And that is a very evil and sociopathic thing to do. Um, and so I don't want to just write it off as him being completely stupid. I mean, I do think he is stupid in some respects. Yeah. Um, but getting back to this. So the interesting thing about this indictment is that these 13 Russians are obviously not in the United States. So they're not actually going to be apprehended. Um, but being indicted makes it much harder for them to travel um, and for them to conduct business and a variety of other things. It also means if they do end up traveling to a country where they could be extradited, um, then they very well may be brought back uh, to the United States. But it also, it sort of embeds Robert Mueller so much that it makes it so much more difficult for him to be fired. And even if he was fired, so much more difficult uh, for the Trump administration to try and undo the work that the FBI agents and people who work in the Department of Justice under Robert Mueller are doing. Um, and it also creates the possibility that one or more of these Russians may end up flipping and coming forward with other evidence about uh, their dealings with the Trump administration. So that, from a legal perspective, it w- is what makes it so interesting. Right. No, it is really interesting. And honestly, at this point, it's just a matter of time before Donald Trump goes down himself. Like, I'm pretty sure somebody is going to say something that's going to further incriminate the president or he's just going to further incriminate himself. Like he tweeted recently, like he, um, he admitted that he knows that Russia was involved in our elections. Cause he was like, Oh, well they started in 2014. I guess they read my mind and knew I was going to run for president. And I'm like, in that tweet, you just admitted that, you know, that they were interfering, but in the, like for the past few months, he was like, Oh, they weren't here. It could have been China. So it's just a hot mess. And speaking of things that are a hot mess, before we wrap up the news roundup and start talking Black Panther, we need to talk about the budget proposal um, that Donald Trump uh, has put forth and his attack on the poor. Alyssa, did you want to delve into that? Yeah, I mean, (laughs) let's start with the idea that Republicans are the people that think that, you know, if you can't buy 35 different types of soda or 25 different types of bread or 36 different types of chocolate that, you know, freedom is somehow dead. And that's why socialism is socialism is bad, because, you know, look at communist Russia, which wasn't even pure socialism anyway. Um, but at the same time, they now think that people on food stamps uh, should get a, I don't know, a ration uh, box of which they're calling the quote unquote harvest box where the government gets to make the decision about what you're allowed to eat if you're poor because you know that's uh not very you know that's very small government and all that jazz on top of the fact that you know this is a huge handout for the military while continuing to cut money from the poor and middle class and even they keep using the phrase entitlement reform which really means taking away people's medicare medicaid and social security tiffany when you found out that donald trump wants to replace um what's called food stamps and he just basically wants to give lunch boxes of unhealthy food to people who can't afford a lot of things that we you know a lot of things that we take for granted what was your thoughts i feel like there's this notion that poor people don't deserve nice things and we have to make their lives so miserable and remind them that they are poor every single day so when you open that box it's like look at your poor self you see this is what you deserve it is the it's disgusting. It's so hurtful because 
we all know a lot of poor people are the hardest working people yep. that, you know, they have jobs, they have multiple jobs. And it's this whole notion that if you just pull yourself up by your bootstrap, you just don't, you won't be poor. But we're not talking about that. Wages hasn't gone up in a, over a decade. Okay, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about how these big spot companies are not paying people living wages. So the fact that you you can have a job and still need governmental assistance, why are we not addressing these issues? Like, that's at the core of this. And why are we trying to punish people and try to make them feel bad because they need help and we're also not recognizing that a lot of people just cannot work because they have disabilities like it's not because they don't want to work like people can't work so we have to recognize that as a country when we say bring your poor bring your ill bring your this but on the flip side we're making it hard for people to even make a living wage for the fight for 15 campaign you had huge billboards up around new york city a liberal progressive city attacking fight for 15 why don't we want to pay people living wages and it's, it's almost like you don't care about the humanity of the person or the dignity of the person. So it was it was frustrating to see that. And it's frustrating to see a billionaire, a billionaire, you know, yeah. tell people that, you know, you're just mismanaging your money. You know, yeah. you're just, you know, on lots, eating lobster and steak and this whole, but, you know, myth but, of a welfare queen. But you know what? There are more white Americans and I would bet mm-hmm. more Trump loyalists and voters who are on welfare or these quote unquote government entitlements than anybody else in the country. So, hey, eat that, Trump base. Uh, mm-hmm. On that note, we do have to take another quick break. Don't go anywhere. When we come back, we'll be talking about Black Panther. I'm super excited to have that conversation. This is Let Your Voice Be Heard. And we are back. This is Let Your Voice Be Heard right here on WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. What's up, Facebook Live? What's up, guys? Listening via Ustream. And hello if you are listening right here in Harlem on 90.3 FM. So as I left off, um, we're going to start talking about Black Panther. Now, this movie is just, it's, it's basically taking over. I mean, it took over my Instagram live stream. Like, everybody that I follow and that follows me has been going to the theaters more than once. And just wearing, just coming out in full costume and just celebrating what is Black Panther. Um, but before I get into it, I just want to let you guys know again, my name is Selena Hill. I'm here with my co-host, Alyssa Fuchs. And we have Tiffany Brown here. She is a legislative and communications associate at a public sector labor union. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> and we Thank also you. have a very special guest um, who has called in, who I'll introduce and another few moments. So, as I mentioned, on Thursday, I had the opportunity to witness the joy, the brilliance, and the extravagance of Black Panther, a Marvel film that featuring a majority all-star black cast and a black superhero protagonist, which was directed by a 31-year-old African-American. Now, the story follows T'Challa as he is sworn in as king of Wakanda. And Wakanda is a secret, technologically advanced nation in East Africa that is powered by the exotic metal known as vibranium. So now this war hero, Black Panther, was first created as a comic book character by two Jewish men in the 1960s during a time when African-Americans were battling during the civil rights era. So besides being an extraordinary film that celebrates the beauty and the power of blackness, by no surprise, the debut of Black Panther is shattering box office records. Um, So on Friday, it took in $75.8 million, and it has a projected domestic debut of anywhere between $205 and $210 million over President's Day weekend. The film will also more than likely be uh, top of any film in February, and it's on track of becoming the biggest debut ever for a superhero pick. But it won't win an Oscar. Uh, I don't. You don't think so? No, I don't. You have no hope. No, I don't. I, you think it'll be? And nominated? I don't think because it's uh, because it's not a phenomenal movie. Although I, I'll admit I haven't seen it yet. Um, but I think because Hollywood's racist. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah. Especially the people who decide who wins an Oscar. Absolutely. Has any Marvel movies ever been nominated for? No. I mean, like superhero. I'm just, look at me super, giving white people a re- no, like super, <laughs> no. superhero movies. Like, don't meet. Like, they might win. Um, you know, what's the like a a SAG award or something mm. like that? But when it comes to the Oscars, like they go for these like very deep films. Yeah. Uh, 
um, you know, like deep m- and white. <laughs> With the exception of Moonlight, but they screwed up the announcement on that one. Yeah, look, it took a we long. It was a nothing. long time coming for <laughs> Moonlight to win. This is why picture. we can't have nice things, <laughs> anyway. Seriously, but um, Black Panther for me, it's not just a movie. It is a moment in time. It is a movement. Like many black people who came out in their daishikis and wearing Black Panther party garb, the film is a celebration of a cultural phenomenon that is shifting narratives and changing the perspective of blackness. Uh, for one, uh, we've been trying to tell God, we've been trying to tell people that Africa is not a country; it is a continent. And it is rich with histories and achievements and everything from the arts and mathematics. But such representation in media and Hollywood did not always portray it as so. Like, do you guys still remember those Feed the Children commercials of, like, starving Africans and Ethiopians? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Th- that was, like, my first introduction of what Africa was like via television. That was that. And those portrayals have... Are deeply rooted in our subconscious and in the fabric of America itself. Now, in this movie, another reason why I've been celebrating, not only because it let the world know that Africa is a continent, but it also celebrated black women and not just any black woman, but brown skin and dark skin black women. And they weren't sexualized. They weren't demonized. They were actually in positions of power. And I was just like, yes, Lupita. Yeah. Like it was it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. On top of that, the movie highlights the diversity of blackness in a time when black and brown people are told that we come from, and I quote, asshole countries, and we continue to fight for justice. We continue to have to fight for dignity and representation. And that is why Black Panther matters so much. And guys, if you want to chime in and let us know what you thought about the movie without any spoilers, feel free to call us up at 212 650 Six nine zero three. Now, Tiffany, I know that you did see the movie. Yes, I and, did. And uh, Black Panther is one of the most political and bold Marvel movies of all time. I want to ask you, what was your initial reaction? Did it live up to the hype and your personal expectations? For me, I feel like when it comes to like big blockbuster movies, especially when it involves black people, I try my best to keep my expectations low. You know, because you don't want to walk it out right, like right. that. No right. So, and also, I can, you know, honestly, I mean, I am not a huge Marvel fan or any of those type of movies. Like, that's just not my, you know, my cup of tea, per se. Like, if it's on TV, I'll watch it. But for this particular movie, I was like, my friend, she had an extra ticket. I was like, cool, I'm going to go with you. And it really blew me away. And it blew me away, particularly because you touched on it, because it had black women, dark skin women that honestly look just like me. You know, the general, Lupita, I can't remember her, uh, the general's name, the actress name, forgive me. But, like, it was women who looked like me, who had shaved heads. And it was just like, oh, my goodness, I had my shaved head. Where were you guys at? But it was so beautiful to see because anytime you do see, like, you know, um, highly anticipated black films, you have, like, a racially ambiguous black girl or really like, and that's fine. But I also think we have to explore the whole diaspora of blackness and all the skin tones that we come in because it is great to see them on film. Um, For me, I didn't really look at Black Panther as, like, a political moment necessarily because I felt like, you know, we we have active Black Panthers that are still incarcerated. We have, you know, people... um, who cannot actually come back to this country. So I think I wanted to kind of like, you know, be wary of how we directly link it to like Black Panther. And I know some people were saying how like, I think it was uh, Michael B. Jordan. He had on some Black Panther attire for the GQ magazine. A lot of people didn't really feel that. And I could see their point of view because, you know, this is a movie based, you know, you know, not a real (laughs) real movie. It's a fictional movie. Fictional movie. So I appreciate what it was offering but i felt like it was it was beautifully done the cast from the from the storyline to how it looked visually even you know um the um album kendrick he's one of my favorite you know problematic rappers like that was the one of the greatest albums and i love the album and the movie so i was i walked out there like blown away honestly um i I won't get into the controversy about uh the (laughs) album art although i think that is relevant maybe we could talk about it later um I haven't seen the movie, but I think what struck me the most was 
seeing a meme on the internet, of course, because <laughs> I guess that's the only place you see memes um, of a little black boy like pointing up at the movie poster. Um, and I think it, was, it may have been a movie and basically telling his parents, like, look, mom, that's me. Wow. And I think that's what we really don't get a lot of, which is like the movies are so white for so long. And black actors and actresses always play supporting roles or, you know, background roles. And so, you know, we don't have enough movies where black people are at the forefront where our young black men and women can look up and say, oh, my God, that's somebody who I can look up to. And, yep. you know, somebody, whether they want to be an actor or an actress or not, just like seeing as somebody who's black on a movie poster in a position where they are, you know, getting seen by the rest of the world it gives young people um, the idea that, you know, they too can be like that. Yep. And I think that's really what's at least from my perspective as somebody who hasn't seen the movie, the most important thing. Yeah, representation matters. I definitely agree. Uh, without further ado, we have on the line with us Ian Freeman. He is the co-founder of the Legion Media Group, which is an integrated marketing group where he specializes in the urban and geek market. He is also a self-described comic book cognoscente. You can correct me because that was the first time I saw the word, but I wanted to give you your props. Ian, and he is also a writer who has appeared in Vibe, Afropunk, Stuff by People Like, and Global Grind. Welcome to the show, Ian. Oh, thank you very much. For, thank you very much for inviting me. Hello, everyone. Morning. Morning. Hello. So, um, as you see, we got the conversation started about Black Panther. Um, did you have any initial reactions to the film? Um. Yes. <laughs> Honestly. Um. I think like everyone else, my initial response, um, I guess as soon as you saw the character back when they first um, kind of put the character out there in uh, the Avengers, well, no, Civil War, um, you know, there was just like a big excitement about, okay, are they really going to do a movie with this person? Is it really going to happen? Then, you know, the lead up into him coming out and then the trailer, but to see the actual movie and see how well it was done, to see the cast, see how the characters, the set design, right down to the soundtrack, it was everything that I hoped it would be. Um, and so, yeah, so I was very excited, very pleased, and I've seen it twice now, I'll probably see it oh, another wow. time. But so, Ian... How surprised are you, or if at all, that a film centered on a black superhero featuring a black cast and shot by a black, black director is actually on the pathway of becoming one of Marvel's biggest blockbusters? Um, I think at any other time in history, I would have been skeptical. I think in today's environment... It's perf It's actually come under, I guess what the best way to say is the perfect storm. Because you've had a lead up where there's been more focus and more interest in Afro-futurism Afro Afro um, with the likes of Janelle Monet, um and Andre 3000 and people of the, that like. Um, more light shown on people like Octavia Butler. Um, Marvel itself has really kind of prepped the world for this with the introduction of characters like Riri Williams, who's the new Iron Man, um, Moon, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, where the heroine of that is a, I think she's like a 10, 11-year-old black female who is labeled the smartest person in the universe. Um, so I think with all of that moving forward and just the, just the times that we're in, um, I think there's just been more, and let me also um, put in there, the, the rise of black Twitter and the adaption of, adaptation of the black and people of color community to technology, to science, the push of STEM, black girls cold, things of that nature, with all of this being focused on um, technology and science. I think this comes at a perfect time where you have people that are actually really ready to digest something like Black Panther. You're right. I 100% agree. I mean, Ian saying the world was ready, 
We'll see. We'll see when it comes to award season how ready our world was for Black Panther. Don't go anywhere, anywhere, guys. We have to go on a quick break. But when we come back, we will continue discussing Black Panther, the phenomenon, Afrofuturism, Black tech, and all that good stuff. This is Let Your Voice Be Heard. And we are back. This is Let Your Voice Be Heard right here on WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. Again, my name is Selena Hill. I'm here with my co-host, Alyssa Fuchs. And we have our correspondent here, Tiffany Brown, from a public sector label union. Label? Labor. Labor. (laughs) That will not be named. She's labeling? No, she's labor. (laughs) It's all about labor. We have on the line with us Ian Freeman. He is the co-founder of the Legion Media Group. He's also a comic book fanatic and a writer. And before we went on break, we were talking about, we were asking the question, is the world ready for Black Panther? And like I said, I'm kind of skeptical. I know that um, they're definitely uh, raking it up at the box office, but we'll see come uh, award season. I mean, listen, I think the idea that the world is not ready is BS, because it's 2017. The world it's 2018. Should, no, I'm sorry, 2018. I'm, I, 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 it's even later in the in the century. I mean, this is a movie that people should have been ready for in the year 1995. Um, you know, like it, it, like Jim Crow ended in the 1960s. Why it's taken so long to have a fully black casted movie about a superhero when Black Panther is based off of a civil rights hero from the 60s, which I, I wanted our hopefully our, have our guest give us a little more background on um, because I unfortunately, while I have a lot of historical background about the civil rights movement, I'm not the best person to talk about about comic books. Um, but, you know, like we should have been ready for this movie 20 years ago. Now, the question about award season is more difficult because as I was saying earlier, just superhero movies in yeah, general, whether right. they're white or black are not usually the types of movies right. that win awards. Yeah, so um, we'll but definitely have to I see. find it really disappointing that in 2018 we're still asking the question, are we ready well, for this kind of movie? And that speaks larger about our society and about how far we've come in race relations. And obviously you have to look at that against the backdrop of Donald Trump being elected president. Well, Alyssa, you brought up a good point about the history and the historical context behind Black Panther. Again, this was a character created during the civil rights movement. And I wanted to uh, get you back into the conversation, Ian, if you can talk a little bit about the correlation between the original Black Panther comic character and what's going on today and the movie today. Sure. Um, So initially, the character of the Black Panther was created uh, 1960, I want to say 1966. So it's like two years after the Civil Rights Act, um, 1964, uh, by Jack Kirby and the person that's all known, Stan Lee, which even if you're not really a comic book fan, you know who Stan Lee is. Um, so yes, yeah, so it was around that time, uh, Stan Lee said that he wanted to really, uh, create a character that was that was answering the call that black people had. So that would reflect more of what the community was and how he saw that there wasn't a character that was really serving the black community. And so he really came up with this idea of the Black Panther, and it was um, actually Jack Kirby who really came up with the character design and had been working on it for a while. And Stanley kind of put that character, uh, brought that character to the forefront, kind of approved it, and moved it forward. Ian, do you think that the character was supposed to portray, like, uh, an empowered black male? Is that what the purpose was behind it? Hmm. I, I believe from what I've read from in terms of Stanley's and and Jack Kirby's ideas behind creating Black Panther, it was more of just creating a character that was empowering to black to the black community that wasn't something that was in the lines of black exploitation because if you look at the terms there were other characters created around that same time frame that were like for example Luke Cage that were definitely more along the lines of Black exploitation and tapped into some of the uh, some of the negative connotations or some of the over exaggerated connotations of what black people were, 
And this character was seen to be more of something that was just tapping into the ideal of what the black experience or black superhero would be. And I'm really glad that you brought up Luke Cage because, you know, that's another black um, comic book hero that has, you know, been adapted for uh, television. But Black Panther was not the first black superhero. In the 1990s, Damon Wayans came out with um, Blank Man. Uh, Robert Townsend came out with The Meteor Man. And we even had Blade, which was released in uh, 1980, 1998, played by Wesley Snipes which was a Marvel vampire hunter. And mm-hmm. then Will Smith did Hancock back in 2008. But I feel like the differences between Black Panther and the other black superheroes that we've seen in the last few decades is the seriousness. I think that people thought that these other black comic heroes were like almost laughable and that they were funny, but people are really taking Black Panther seriously. Mm-hmm. Tiffany, what do you think about that? Um, I I remember Meteor Man. I don't remember Blank Man, but I do think with Meteor Man, it was almost like cheeky and right. like fun. It was like the, your neighborhood superhero. But with Black Panther, I also think we have to just really talk about Ryan Coogler. Is that how you yes, pronounce his Ryan name? Ryan Coogler. Coogler, excuse me. And I think this is the first time that you've seen uh, a black uh, creative that has such a big, huge, enormous budget and is putting together such a beautifully and well done film. And on top of that, I think Ryan Coogler, like he said, one of the reasons why he had, you know, so many different, I would say, like women in his film, because they reminded him of his aunts and his cousins that he grew up with. And I thought that was like beautiful. And additionally, the first time that I really came into, you know, he came into my mind was when he did Fruitvale Station. Oh, yes, I saw that. And I felt from there and everyone knows what happens in that movie. We know we see this man get shot by, uh, you know, a cop. But... When that scene happened, you know, like the life of the movie was just like left the movie theater. So I feel like he is a well accomplished creative director. Like he can put together a well, he can put together a great story. And I think him doing Black Panther, I, I believe Marvel already said that they would definitely want him to come back to do the second one. I was like, you know, he is very well aware whether he's, you know, You know, in black Twitter, you could tell that he is very well versed in like what we're talking about and how we're talking about uh, uh, issues when it comes to like intersectionality and, you know, womanhood and things of that nature. So I think it's great that we have this creative able to bring forth this uh, movie because I feel like you're going to see other creatives like Ava DuVernay is coming out with a wrinkle in time. We're going to see a lot of other black artists and creators going to be able to tell their own stories in their own ways and these a lot of these big budget houses will not be able to ignore them right absolutely you know and definitely get your um definitely want to get your response um and you know as we bring this conversation to a close with you i also wanted to ask you if you can um really quickly talk about how black panther really incorporated tech black tech and afrofuturism into the movie do you think it did did you, do you think it did Afrofuturism justice? Yes. I mean, the, in, the, in the short answer is yes. Um, I think if you, just like you, uh, now tie it back all in with, when they were talking about the creation of the Black Panther, like his introduction to the comic book world was he defeated the, the Fantastic Four, which at the time, to- by himself, honestly, at the time when, the Fantastic Four was the most popular comic team at the time, making him, like, he was, at the time, supposed to be smarter than Reed Richards, who was the smartest person at the time. And so you have this nation that is technologically more advanced than anything else on the planet. And it almost creates, like, this ideal scenario where... What we what would we have been, or what would Africa have been without colonization, with just the resources and the ideas and the creativity and just the the opportunity? What would have happened with Africa if there was no colonization? If they were just left to their own devices to be able to utilize their resources and utilize their imagination and create? And I think that. Black Panther, the movie, taps into that. And um, it almost makes you kind of, well, I'll I'll speak for myself, it almost made me kind of jealous when I was sitting down um, just to think like, wow, 
if our ancestors didn't go through this, what what could we have been? I 100% agree because Black Panther, one of the underlying themes in there is the power Africa actually possessed when it comes to resources and just brilliance. And you're right. If there wasn't slavery and colonization, who knows where where and how far not only Africa would have been, but we as a whole entire country, excuse me, a whole entire world, because everyone suffers. Everyone has been suffering because of colonization. On that note, Ian, we do have to let you go. But before we say goodbye, I just want you to give you a few moments to let everyone know how they can contact you and follow you via social media. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me on. Um, reaching out to me is pretty easy. It's I L Freeman across everything. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you again. And um, before we wrap up, just 30 seconds, everyone. Uh, last question. Uh, Tiffany, do you think Black Panther has the power to change the perception of black people in media and in Hollywood and in society? Oh, that's a, a loaded question. I and think, you only got 30 seconds. I think Black Panther has the power to allow other creators like Ryan Coogler to be able to present their stories. Do I think it will change the perception of Africa? Um... I think people who are knowledgeable and want to have that knowledge and know better will know that, you know, Africa is more than, you know, the Feed the Children commercials. But people who are racist or bigoted, I don't think it's going to change their mind too much. Right. No, I agree with that. I mean, I just will bring it back around to the comment I made earlier uh, about the young boy looking up. I mean, you know, we obviously want to have uh, black people as role models and in all different areas, whether it's President Barack Obama, a movie star, a scientist or a sports hero. We want to have a plethora of black people for young black people to look up to. Um, and I think that's really important, especially because we're living in a time in society where we are not going to see a majority white society as we move forward. And so it's really important that we embrace the diversity. Thank you for that, Alyssa. Uh, thank you for that, Tiffany. I just want to leave you guys with a final few thoughts. Honestly, my expectations are not is not for Black Panther to change pretty much anything in society. I think that the work that organizers like Tiffany Brown, like Stanley Fritz and Jackie Cohen, who aren't here, I think that people who are grassroots, who are activists and who are on the ground every single day, they are making the changes when it comes to policy and legislation that we need to see in this country that will protect black and brown people. So I don't really look to Hollywood and entertainment to do that because at the end of the day, it's all about capitalism for them. I don't think that Disney and Marvel set out to empower the black community and uplift our communities with this movie. I think it was about money and they yep. finally understand the value of the black dollar. But the thing is, they also need to understand, and this goes for every industry, we're not going to continue to give our money and give our dollars unless you are helping our causes. So I think that there's definitely a correlation between there when it comes to like movies that touch on social economical themes or pro black or anything that happens to be uplifting to our causes. But it, there needs to definitely that we definitely need to see more of that in entertainment. I would say on that note, we before we go, yeah. real quick, I just want to give you three important dates. March 14th is the Women's March for Action Against Gun Violence. March 24th is the National March for Our Lives in Washington, D.C. And April 20th is the National School Walkout Against Gun Violence. Let's support all of them. Connect with us about how you can get involved. All right. Thank you for that. And on that note, we do have to say goodbye, but we thank everyone for tuning in and listening. Uh, if you guys want to catch this show again or just share it via podcast, you can check us out on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. That's Let Your Voice Be Heard. We also go by the acronym LYVBH. So check us out and we'll see you next Sunday.